May the Lord be with you. I get a sense of what Chris means when he says he dislikes having to preach a sermon after, after Pat and the choir. Thank you so much, Pat. Um, so I have preached in a various, various, various settings. I've preached on mountains with snow skis on my feet. I've preached in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. I've preached in campgrounds to two people, four turkeys, and a bear, but never behind a pulpit. So this is uh, it's, uh, wonderful to be here today. I'd invite you to turn with me in your copy of Holy Scripture to the 13th chapter of the Gospel of Luke, and we'll be looking at verses 10 through 17. Now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath, and just then there appeared a woman with a spirit that had crippled her for 18 years. She was bent over and quite unable to stand up straight. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said, Woman, you are set free from your ailment. When he laid his hands on her, immediately she stood up straight and began praising God. But the leader of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had cured on the Sabbath, kept saying to the crowd, There are six days on which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be cured, not on the Sabbath day. But the Lord answered him and said, You hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his donkey? or his ox from the manger, and lead it away to give it water? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for eighteen long years, be set free from this bondage on the Sabbath day? When he said all of this, his opponents were put to shame. The entire crowd was rejoicing at all the wonderful things he was doing. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? Father, for these words, we are thankful for Jesus' compassion. We are thankful. Enter with us now into this time of teaching and hearing that your words will be clear and mine not heard. For it's in your precious and holy name we pray. Amen. When I was in college, I worked at a local grocery store. I was... Uh, the closing manager, that means my job was simply to stay after everyone else and make sure the store closed properly um, and make sure everything was ready to go for the next morning. Um, one evening I come in to find a mop bucket and a mop sitting in the aisle. Uh, so what do I do? Of course I remove it. I went home. I thought everything was wonderful. I come in to work the next day to be greeted by my boss. He said something like this, hey dummy, <laughs> that bucket was to catch the water for the leak in the roof. <laughs> Needless to say, the frozen food section had uh, been standing in water all night. So uh, if you wanted to visit that, you kind of had to wear your waders. So have you ever tried to do the right thing only to see your hard work backfire on you? Have you ever tried to perform a good deed for someone only to have that person or people around you question your motives. If you're like me, you have to fight the urge to say, I'll never put myself in that situation again. I'll not try to help that person again because I've got to worry about my future. You know, Jesus experienced these types of things on a regular basis throughout the entirety of his ministry. During his lifetime, he was regularly questioned about his motives, misunderstood when he tried to do good things, accused of not being as helpful as he actually was. And more often than not, he regularly found himself in trouble because of something he had done. The people he mostly stayed in trouble with were the religious establishment of his day. In our passage today, Jesus was accused of doing something wrong by the religious folk. So let's look at what's going on here. To understand this story a little better, Let's get a little more understanding of our setting. This passage here takes place in a synagogue. This place is where religious life for followers of Judaism takes place. Here they prayed and studied and participated in other specific acts of worship. It was their sacred place. Within synagogue life, there was an ongoing practice of giving high priority to the act of following rules. From how you are to dress, 
when to sit, when to stand, who could read or speak. Things were just to happen in a particular way. Synagogue life was based on the belief that God had given people rules to follow. He had given his people commands that they were to follow. These commands weren't meant to punish the people, but to help them manage themselves as well as set out parameters of their relationships with one another and their relationship with God. Now, one of these commands that was given was to honor the Sabbath and keep it holy. It was to be a day of rest, a day of reset and worship of God the Father. The Sabbath was to be a time to acknowledge God's power and authority in all that God had accomplished on behalf of freeing them from their imprisonment in Egypt. One of the challenges of synagogue life was that certain leaders would take God's commands to an unintended extreme. They would kind of add their own ideas and clarifications to what God had already given the people. And here we read that they kind of confuse this idea of what work and what rest is. As these humankind people tried to clarify God's words, the results were that the spirit and reason behind God's commands were no longer as important as the fact that God had given the command in the first place. They completely missed the point that God was making by giving the command. In this passage, Jesus is faced with multiple challenges to his authority and his stature as a wise teacher. The first challenge he likely faced is that the people in the synagogue thought they really knew who he was because he grew up in the area and they couldn't get past that fact. It's kind of like going to grandma's house at age 33 and her still picking your cheeks and telling you how cute you are. She can't seem to get past that fact that you're a full-grown six-foot man and you have a beard. <laughs> so the people can't believe that someone of his pedigree, someone of his lowly stature is as smart as he is. They can't believe that a lowly carpenter can possess so much knowledge. Secondly, he did the scariest thing that anyone can imagine. He came along and started teaching new things. He taught that the people should put their trust in God through him and not the rituals and traditions of the synagogue. So while Jesus is teaching among the crowd in a synagogue, a woman who had an ongoing disability comes in and immediately Jesus' focus changes to her. You know, I have to imagine the pain, the humiliation and depression this woman likely felt. It wouldn't be uncommon for a woman such as this to come to the synagogue daily or several times a week to pray and lift up her prayers for healing for her crippled body. And I have to wonder how the synagogue leader felt about his presence and about the woman's presence. This woman clearly has a need and want to be healed, but no one, including the synagogue leader, had been able to help her thus far. No amount of prayer or offerings or anything else had made a difference in her condition. So Jesus calls her over and says, Woman, you are set free from your ailment, and you are made well. So Jesus is able to make this woman whole instantaneously. He saw her need, and he addressed it. You know, I have to imagine everyone who saw this happen thought, this miracle was amazing, and they begin to praise God for the blessing as well. Everyone except for the leader of the synagogue. He wasn't pretty happy. He was very displeased. He was displeased because Christ violated the command to keep the Sabbath holy and not to work. So the synagogue leader become upset, and he began to protest that this woman could have received healing any other of the six days of the week. The first issue with a statement is that the synagogue leader is simply sticking to the letter of the law and not the spirit of the law. The man is so stuck on what day of the week it is, he can't see God moving before his eyes. In contrast, Jesus couldn't allow the tradition of the synagogue to exclude a person from experiencing the loving touch of God on this particular day of the week. The second problem was that Christ's ability to heal the woman revealed a lot about the leader of the synagogue. If Christ could heal her when she hadn't been healed before, 
what would be the point of continuing to go to the synagogue? Knowing that the synagogue leader was more concerned about keeping the status quo, Jesus calls him and those like him hypocrites. One theologian suggests that we must be careful of our rules and traditions. They often become more important than people. People are priority with God, and God made creation for fellowship with people. Our rules can often say more about us individually than they can about God. So Jesus displays to us that there are clear occasions when doing the wrong thing is actually right. When the Holy Spirit prompts us to give of ourselves on behalf of others, this is always the right time to do something that may not be seen as acceptable. So what, what can we learn from Christ's actions is that doing certain things, like having compassion for others, welcoming other people, and giving of ourselves to meet the needs of others is more important than following tradition and rules. Christ's love was not and is not bound by rules. And if we are called to imitate Christ, our love shouldn't be bound either. When we do these things, we will face some type of opposition. Not everyone will agree with us or seek to welcome people and meet their needs or even trust your motives. No matter the opposition or consequences, we must see our actions as part of our service to God the Father in response to the love he has shown to us. Showing love is 100% of the time more important than adhering to tradition. Laws and rules may help us order our world, but grace is what holds our world together. When our ways and our traditions interfere with God's grace, it's time for us to reevaluate. One, one of my favorite scholars said, Watch out for the voices of those who don't want healing to be done on the Sabbath, for we must ask the question, what is the real agenda here? Jesus calls us to unmask the hard-hearted agendas and realize the essence of the gospel and the law is compassion. All of our debates must pass the test of the great commandment to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, and mind, and to love our neighbor as ourselves. May we be found faithful in doing and following them both. Would you pray with me? Father, with this day, we give thanks. We give thanks for the example you set before us to teach us that above all, loving our God and loving our neighbor is of the utmost importance. Help us to be faithful in doing and keeping your commandment. For it's in your precious and holy name I pray. Amen.